Hello, hello. Hello, my name is James Taylor and welcome to another episode of Invad Entry. Today we are going to be building or talking about building a V-Space V space War Plotter. And you might notice on my screen I've got the Norwich Hack Space open. Um, Norwich Hack Space is a, a workshop community in Norwich um, and it's a wonderful thing. And it's not just about having access to the tools, it's actually about the people there. I, I've learned so much about mechanical engineering and things like using the lathe and, and just getting experience from people uh, that I just wouldn't have got if I just bought the equipment and done it in my own house. Uh, but also I get access to gear that I, 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 I don't have in my house, I don't have space for my house, so it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, they are trying, they've been suffering because of Covid and people haven't been going to meetings and things like that and, and there have been very strict rules on, on how many people can be in the space at one time, it's quite a small area uh, in terms of Covid things. Uh, so they started this year by doing a, a lockdown challenge, eight week challenge with mini grants. They're actually paying members back some of their membership money, which is wonderful, to build something in lockdown. And I must say the the, the wealth of people suggesting ideas of things to go build and the the scope, the, the difference of things people are trying to build is really, really cool. Uh, there's a lot of people building things like cabinets, there's things like window curtain openers, um, there's my war plotter. There's also some things that people have like little projects going on. So it's really nice to see that. Um, I decided to build a war plotter, and I've been looking at war plotters. I read a book in about 2000, you know, about this art project which used a giant V-shaped plotter, big sheets of, of cloth on the side of a building to, and a spray can in that mount to draw giant pictures. Um, and I always wanted to build one, and I thought, well, eight weeks, let's let's see if we could build one. Looked into it. There are some kits online. If you want to build one yourself, I would recommend just buy one of the kits, if I'm honest with you, because you know at the end it's going to work. I didn't. I bought uh, an Arduino, some shields, and looked at the source code and went my own way. I'll talk about some of the journey I went in building it. And I've got to say here, the Norwich Hack Space really helped me again because I had some problems with my stepper motors. And even remote, their experience of what does and doesn't work, what the problems might be, they're like, have a look at this. And in the space of just two evenings, uh, my thing went from sort of vibrating in this sort of mess of wires to actually being a very accurate plotter just by a couple of comments these guys made and the encouragement they gave it was really really helpful so big shout out to Notch Hack Space if you're in Norwich and looking for getting into building stuff and making things Notch Hack Space recommend them 100% about the price of a gym membership per month um, but much better for you in my opinion than a gym So, on to what a V-plotter is. A V-plotter is basically two motors. Some people use motors and rotary encoders. I've gone down the stepper motor route. Uh, stepper motors are quite cheap these days, mainly because of 3D printers and home CNC machines that low-end stepper motor market is flooded with uh, quite good quality stepper motors. Like a good quality for what I'm trying to do. Um, and basically what you do is you put a bit of a balance weight on either end of, of a wire, a bit of string. Uh, old designs used... Um, ball and, and a, like a sprocket type so you'd have like a ball and chain like you're having your lights like this sort of material but timing belts again 3d printers cad cam machine time belts are so cheap these days i bought five meters for like a pound two pounds on that so it, i used a timing belt and a and a, a gear sprocket type thing uh and then a gondola and the gondola which maybe has a third motor in or a servo or i've seen one use um, a solenoid to actually sort of hammer a pen but you use that just to pull the pen away from the paper so you can do an attended drawing. Now, I, I will admit right now, I, my, my build is in the prototype stage, um, but that's important thinking through how you're going to actually do that, whether it's going to be manual, whether you're just going to do one continuous path, and there's various algorithms you can do that help. So it doesn't have to be a pen-up, pen-down mechanism if you can build one, um, and in fact, you can get some really cool stuff without that. 
So first thing you do is you build some kind of control unit and then you're going to drive it with software. My original plan was to use Gerbil and the reason that was that I can have loads of things that generate G-code can then send G-code to Gerbil. And you might think the Gerbil out of the box will work because it looks like, yes, if I pull this, this is X and this is Y or this is Y and this is X and it will work. But the reality is it doesn't and the reason is the angles. And if I put the gondola in different places, you'll see that these angles are not always 90 degrees. So pulling this wire will always pull it closer, but on an arc of, of, of whatever this length is. So you have to translate from an XY coordinate into a, a, um, a triangle coordinate, which is actually really easy to do, uh, but you have to remember what you're measuring in. So that, well, in my code, I actually have three measurements at all times. So I basically have an XY coordinate of where I want am or want to be, and I convert that into a length of where I want to be, and I convert that into a number of steps, because the motors don't really understand length, they understand how many steps, I want to go three steps, four steps. And the control boards I'm using, and the libraries I'm using, understand steps rather than actual length. So you have to do the length of step calculation yourself. I also found that, bizarrely, my right-hand motor isn't as uh, the same number of steps per minute as my left-hand motor, even though I bought two at the same time, the same batch, they are actually different. Again, they're cheap they're different enough to give a skew on the final picture. Uh, so this basically is, is designed as you pull one wire or pull one wire, you can move the gondola to any point in this area, or so you think. The actual reality is you can't, and this is your actual workable area, and I'll sort of try and demonstrate why. At this point, if your gondola is up here in the middle, the the weight of the gondola pen, and you do want to put a bit of extra weight on that as well, if I'm honest with you, the weight of this is straight down. So your weight of pulling up, if you do your high school physics, is actually that the the vertical component of this weight is a tiny compared to the horizontal. So you're pulling sideways quite a lot just to pull that thing level. And that means that the the number of teeth you've got here really matter because at some point you're going to slip. It's it, it's not perfect. It's going to go chunk. It's not a chain that's on the sprocket. Usually you've got tension gears. So at per, some point tension it will slip and then once it's slipped the rest of your drawing is out by by five millimeter or whatever and if it slips again it's out by another five millimeter so you've got to be careful up here over here while the up and down is perfect what you find is this wire here begins to droop so you've got no sideways pulling so somewhere over here you find that it, it, the, the actual friction of the pen on the whiteboard or paper or whatever you're drawing on is too high so over this side it, it, the the right hand wire is not tense and the left hand's fine, and over here it's this wire that's not tense enough. It, it you begin, you know, it begins to droop like this. This is the issue. So you find that the workable area. Ooh, I didn't mean to do that. We take that random point out. The workable area is is somewhere in the middle. And of course, at the bottom. Oh dear, it's all going from bad to worse. At the bottom. What have I done here? Oh, I done. Let's take that away. At the bottom here, the wires are just too long. Like, and, and of course, these things go up as as so you get to about here, and it, it, it jams. So somewhere down here, the wires are down. So you've got a, a maximum usable area in the middle of this. And the answer basically is, if you try to draw an A4 sheet, uh, yep, the police are coming for me again. Uh, <laughs> if you're trying to draw like an A4 sheet. As long as you built it bigger than A4, you're fine. And the answer is if you want to draw A3 or A1, just make these further apart and make them higher up. So try and make your machine as big as you can because that gives you a larger working area. You will benefit from afterwards. Um, I'll show you my build. I will get onto my build. Uh, but that's basically the, the, the outcome of the theory. You basically have a much smaller working area. And I reckon it's about a third, for my, my practical experiments, about a third of the of the total air is actually usable maybe a half if you really want to push it a little bit um, also you're not going to get very accurate plots with these by the way if you want accurate plots uh, build an xy plotter it's that simple um, you, the rigidness of the of the structure will be more important build like a screw thread xy plot you'll get much much more accurate uh, and you can do end stops and things like that so you can go self-homing uh, with this one i don't have self-homing i could build something based on the weights perhaps um, but i don't have a self-homing system which causes me problems with, with gerbil variants. Um, and there are some other issues around uh, these, these V-plotters as well. Um, so the one thing to work out, the other reasons why it won't be accurate is you've got weights, these things weigh, so they actually sag. So you actually aren't where you think you are ever because there isn't such a thing as uh, an inelastic weightless string. That's a mathematical construct which just doesn't exist in the real world. The other thing is that's really weird is that if you actually, if you're, if you're 
if you um, build the cogs big, this will affect you more. I don't really care. For me, it's like three, four millimeters difference. But as you attach the wire in different angles, the angle here is different. What's also important to note is that as you get to the top here, this arc here gets smaller because this wire doesn't go around. So actually the ability to slip, the friction on that reduces the higher you go up, which combined with the tension means it's even more likely to slip. You can solve that. Um, by adding in another sprocket. Now I use tooth belts, so this, this side is teethy. And if you use a tooth belt, basically what what happens is you're going to oh, put a second uh, circle in there. What basically happens is you're basically going to have something like this go on. I'm just going to draw this badly. Uh, there you go. You, you have this sort of S shape going on, like you've got on a gear. And that basically means that at least half the gear is going to be connected at once. Or you could make some kind of invention there where, where this is better. Um, you can, I bought four of these actually, so I can use the second one there on the back where it's smooth and it will just it will just run nice and smooth against that. It's not actually going to turn. So yeah, understand the friction there is important. Um, and remember, this is, this is for fun. All these things are for fun, so it doesn't matter to me too much if, if there is a bit of slippage or it's not perfect. And I'll show you some of my prints I've done. So my plan was to make scribbles anyway, so there's always going to be a, a lack of perfectness on it. The second thing to, to realise about the mechanics are the gondola design. So in an ideal world, these wires come in and connect in the centre of the pen, bang on the centre, so you know exactly where that is. The reality is that doesn't happen, and you basically got three versions of this. There are two simple versions, and then uh, a third, uh, massively complicated. So the first one is just attach it to the corners, and you can see this is a very, very um, uh, exaggerated angles here. But you can see there's a difference between the actual ideal and if I attach it to the corners. Now, if you've got those corners of my gondola about three or four centimeters apart you don't really notice that much. So I've gone with this attach the corners method and I just don't worry about the fact it's a little bit out. Uh, the guys in the hack space have built something called a Maslow, which actually is a router version of this, and they've built a very large mechanical thing uh, because the accuracy does matter. So I, it depends on how accurate you want to be. Again, if you want accurately, don't build one of these. Build a very large, rigid uh, XY plotter. Okay. The second version is the offset version, which again is actually gives you accuracy in theory, uh, where you attach to a point and you understand that point is a centimetre, two centimetres above your pen. And then when you're doing your design, you just without either everything just comes out a centimetre lower, or you just work out what that centimetre delta is. Um, so this is good, but again, attaching to a point can be a bit, and maybe you've got a little peg or so, and you've looped the wire around the peg. Um, so you've got two simple designs, and then the the other designs you find on online is people building like attachments, which are like based on parallelograms, which means you effectively get this. You've actually attached it to a construct here, but the line always goes to the centre point. So you can build more advanced gondolas. Um, think about what other electronics you're going to put in your gondola, like servos or steppers or whatever, to actually uh, push the pen on and off the paper. But whether your gondola is fitting flat and you're moving the pen, or whether you're just going to push the gondola off, those things matter. What I've also discovered is that when you're on a whiteboard, it matters as well, because if you're pushing your whiteboard off, um, um, it, you, if you can rub out what your drawing is, because the whiteboard, it just rubs out. So if you're drawing ink on paper, you don't have those sort of problems. So to customise your build for what you want to get out of it, your mileage may vary, and yeah, it is what it is. Okay, so talking a little bit about the build versus buy um, mentality, you could go out and buy a kit, uh, and they cost like two hundred, two hundred dollars, two hundred pounds, something like that. Or you can go buy the components and hope it all works go together. And I actually bought two versions of the shield. I've built stepper motor controls before. Um, I, I, but weirdly, I haven't had a great experience with them. When I was at university, twenty years ago. Uh, basically we built this step three-phase stepper motor thing and it caused lots of mini explosions actually my recollection of that project um, which was fun um, so basically though I decided to go down the route of buying a board so this is the ramps shield it costs about seven quid um, on next day delivery so you can probably buy it cheaper if you're willing to wait 
uh, and it's plugged onto the back of an Arduino Mega. Um, so uh, standard Arduino Mega onto a ramp shield, two driver chips, again, not very much money, and then the servo motors themselves on the back of here, which I'll take them off in a moment. So the first thing I did was wire it all together without long wires. Uh, I've also got, I've added a, um, a servo on, which I added literally last night. So most of the drawings you've seen or we're seeing are done without servo. You see my hand coming around, actually lifting it off the whiteboard and draw it back on. I'll get back onto Twig. This is my most recent drawing. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it works. So so you get it all plugged in, you wait for the steppers to move, to move motors to move. Once you've got the stepper motors moving at a speed which works just about using either code, whatever gel, whatever you're using, then you are ready to progress to the next stage, which is the prototype stage. Now, at this point, um, I didn't want to do the full building, you know, plank of wood, make it all nice. I just wanted to get it working. So I am using plastic crocodile clips um, and my rig is actually made out of cardboard. So I received a bit of uh, thing in the post and basically all I did was attach the servo motor to the cardboard if using the four screws originally I put it on here and I realized there was actually a ridge on my whiteboard so I've just got another couple of packing slips there that just go in there and and I've got these these are quite strong clamps um, I just put two there and notice it sags a little so I just have the third one here just to just to hold this end up, not actually to give it much more support to hold the end up. So one either side of that, get the V-strap on, and then be aware that the first few things are gonna fly off, because you're gonna get the speeds wrong. On the gondola side, again, it is mostly held together by uh, little crocodile clips. I got a bag of crocodile clips for Christmas a few years back. They're fantastic. I didn't have enough clamps. I was always jealous of YouTubers who are like, they build things and then they go clamp it together. I'm like, oh man, I need more clamps in my life. Anyway, so the gondola is the height of technology here. And actually, I actually made it a bit better last night. So the gondola is a cardboard box um, with a hole for a pen. Now I'm gonna make another version of this later, uh, to, or I might just adapt this one so I can actually put a Sharpie in it rather than a pen. Uh, so the pen sort of fits the holes and then I just use a clamp to hold it in place at the depth I want to hold it in place. Now the servo is a, a recent addition to actually push the pen off and I found this doesn't work very well, especially on the whiteboard um, where it sort of, sort of, I don't know if you see here, but it actually has rubbed out a line here. And I've, I've got a, a video of it working very badly. It's very violent as well because it throws the thing off the board as it comes back in. Uh, the distance between the push off and the pen is really important actually. Um, you want it to be as line so it doesn't have a twisting motion so as it drops back in it actually twists back in which is a bit of a, a, bit of a problem. Anyway, so that's the gondola. So the first thing to do is to work out the angles and all that malarkey. Um, so the first thing I did was write, uh, I tried a whole bunch of open source things and in the end I went decided to go for my own code. Uh, so the first thing I did was basically build, um, uh, uh, look at controlling the motors and I wrote some code by hand to do it a couple of the guys in the hack space pointed me towards a couple of libraries. So I'm now using the libraries, I'm just saying do this many steps. And it's stuck in a loop to actually run there. But it handles all those, the interaction with the, the ramps board. And it handles the pin ups, pin down, all the rest of the pin enables. I just say go to this point, let's in a loop until I go there. So I can now can go, say these motors to go to a particular length. To keep myself sane, I'm calling the left hand one over there the A motor and this one the B motor. I haven't tried calling the X and Y. A lot of source code says, oh, it's the X and Y axis because they're built for, for you know, gerbil machine or you know CNC machines, 3D printers. But I've got no A motor and B motor and I translate between what I call the A and B distance and an X, Y location. So the first thing I did was um, I actually built a spirograph machine completely on the Arduino. Um, and I will show those results now. Sorry, I, I, I briefly lied there. The first thing I actually did was drew, drew this kind of uh, experiment. And the idea behind this is actually to see, can I draw horizontal and vertical lines? Because drawing a horizontal line requires letting one motor out and taking another motor in. Drawing a vertical line means 
taking both modes in and out. So this is demonstrating that I actually do have an X, Y, 2, A, B length calculations done correctly. Um, it may not be obvious here, but this is a, a very important test pattern. The test pattern here is showing this distance and this distance are supposed to be the same. And similarly, this distance and this distance are supposed to be the same. These are actually supposed to be squares. Uh, this one is actually the same as this one again, showing that I haven't quite got the length, I haven't got it calibrated, and I realise that I have to basically start from a known position. You, you, because the angles are always different, you have to know where you are at all times to work out how far you have to move. It sounds um, obvious, but that's not like an XY plotter. On an XY plotter, if I want to move left and up by 3 and 3, I just move left and up by 3 and 3. On a, on a Y plotter, you have to know where you are to work out any relative distance. There is no, no true relative movement. Everything is an absolute movement, effectively. So the first thing I did was was the sort of test patterns, just saying how I got XY control. And I did those just by saying, literally, I'm going to encode in a left, right, on the serial. So on the serial, so I'm going left and right and making it go left and right. <laughs> Uh, the spiral graph, and you can see there's no server on this, and actually the, the square here is actually held together with an actual uh, with a clamp, it's just clamped together. Um, the spiral graph control is interesting because, I, again, this circle, you might think it's off because the angle of photo, no, it's not a circle, again, there's a, there's a distortion effect going on, which I haven't completely managed to work out, probably because the accuracy is on my measurement, probably because the accuracy of the motor, say one motor, doesn't quite do the same distance per millimetre, steps per millimetre as the other motor does. Uh, but the spirograph is this very simple point. I take an offset, which is here. I then just do some math.science. So I work at an angle, and then I add that angle on. If it goes over 2 pi, I subtract the angle again. And then I just do math dot, um, uh, sin and cos to work out where I should be and see if I can draw uh, effectively a spirograph. Uh, so all my friends joked I built the most world's overcomplicated spirograph. Uh, the reality is it's not overcomplicated yet. We can make this much more over-engineered weather over engineered we can over engineer this some more i take that as a compliment that is what we're trying to do here you know if, if i want an accurate picture i just switch my print on and print it this is about fun so yeah spirograph here i i do like spirograph i think we're going to be drawing some more complicated spirographs in the future the main point about this is showing that control and actually what you don't know here is i actually ran the top one three times on the exact same point uh, and you can kind of see here, that's where I started, that's where I end. It actually has run over the line several times. And so I'm really pleased with the accuracy that it repeats the same movements. Um, but I, this was on the first library. I then swapped my library and tried a different mechanism. Uh, and I will show you the outputs of that. So I wanted to get acceleration control in because I wanted the motors. It's still me saying, yeah, move, move, move. The other thing that's really important here is to say that I've actually, on the first diagram, I had... I could basically up and down, left and right, and I could do diagonal. I couldn't do any line which wasn't a, a, a 45 degree angle because I was moving both motors at the same time. They were stepping at the same time, which meant if I wanted to go to an off angle, it would basically move at 45 degrees and then go straight at the end. So I did have some very bad uh, motions that I, I captured. Um, and all those meant something. Um, so moving at non-45 degree angles was really important. <laughs> This here, it actually is one of my most important pictures. Uh, it may look like a failure, but actually it's really important because this was actually the first time I had acceleration control. Now, I've actually taken acceleration control off, but as you can see here, it's accelerating and then it sort of curves round. So these lines are actually going slow, slow, fast, 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 slow, 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 slow. So again, this was a spiral graph. The corners aren't perfect. I was getting some slippage. I was, having, I was doing some other things at the same time. Uh, but this here was progress. For me, this 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 meant something. I mean, I can measure some of these lines. And yeah, I actually did have some really cool acceleration control going on. So this was the first time I did with the new library. Um, and it was like, okay, maybe I don't want acceleration control. Maybe I want just lots of small movements while on these large movements which have problems with. So I moved away from controlling the motors together and instead decided to use the library, which says I can control most at the same time. 
And the idea there is, like I say, go to this location, uh, as it thinks it's XY, but I say, go to this, this number of steps, and it will guarantee that both motors arrive there at the same time. It does that calculation for me. Again, uh, this this here, by the way, is slippage. Uh, another test image here. This was a slippage. This was me um, filling with the wire at the top. But this here was slippage, and this here was slippage as well. So I drew a triangle straight, and I drew a bigger triangle. And you can see the acceleration was kicking in. One motor accelerated before the other motor accelerated. Even though they ended at the same point, this isn't what I want. I don't want these curved lines. It does mean it moves faster. So for a pen up, go to location, acceleration control is fantastic. But pen down, I couldn't get rid of these curves using that particular library. Now, I didn't really want to implement my own version of acceleration control either. And most of my movements are going to be small movements. So um, this basically showed me that the way I was going, and this was a straight line as well. You see the acceleration control kicks in and you get this curved effect. So this isn't what I want. I want nice, straight movements, linear movements. <laughs> Here we can actually see me doing one of those calibration techniques here. So I'm trying to get from the 80-80 mark to this 30-20 mark. I'm pretty happy if it gets anywhere within this area. I'm going to count that as a win. Um, but we'll see what happens. And um, uh, Tab is helping me draw, hit, measure, hit, film this on two phones for some reason. Um, but here we go. So it starts here. And it's going to go to this point. Then it's going to go back home again. And again, that's that curve coming into play here. It goes all the way exactly, almost to bang on the point. Now, as you can see here, I talked about earlier, the angles change at this point. And then going back, there is no slippage here. Because you can see it goes slow, and then it's going to accelerate out. So I get these curves, and that's the issue with the acceleration. So at this point, I pretty much knew that whilst I had the accuracy, and it was going to bang on the point, and it was going bang to the next point, and I could repeat that over and over again, I was getting a form of control over the system, but it wasn't the control I wanted. It wasn't the accurate control I wanted. You see here on the right hand side, actually, this is uh, quite a good shot there of um, my power supply. I'm actually using a lab bench power supply for this at the moment. Uh, I'm using Jupiter at the moment. So the other thing I've upgraded at this point is the, the Arduino is pretty dumb. It basically is just controlling the number of steps. I'm controlling all the where to go logic from Python at the moment. It's in a Jupyter notebook so I can then play and experiment with it a bit more. Uh, and I'll come back to some of my design logic, probably not in this video, but in the next video. Uh, about some of the decisions I'm making about how to go where I want to go. So the next thing I did was I coded up a path and, and this was the start of being able to do any picture at all. So I basically worked out the coordinates for everything in my Twitter handle, Jmons, um, and I first of all I drew it using the acceleration control and I got some pretty weird outputs from honest with you. So it went to the start location, it drew the letters. But it had these weird side effects here of, of it, it went across and then it went up and down. And I, it, it, and then again, the M here, it, then, it didn't quite sort itself out. It was like the acceleration didn't quite reset properly. So I didn't get the nice crisp lines. Here, this, this O is actually eight points. It looks like four, but it's actually eight points. So I got a lot of movement here. I did, what, what, with this acceleration here, I didn't get that here. So it is a bit strange that sometimes I got this effect and sometimes didn't, but I didn't get the output. I didn't have the control over the individual pen in between 
point movement I wanted. So I rewrote the code again, got rid of the acceleration, used the same library because got rid of the acceleration control, threw in the same coordinates, just offset now by another you know, five centimeters or so, and drew it again. I didn't do my pen up because I had to hold the pen off a little bit. So I didn't do the pen up from the origin. And here you can actually see the line is much better controlled. And you can actually see this now has eight points rather than four. And I got the end. So I knew at this point that if I have a path defined as a Python array of coordinates, I just have an array of coordinates, it will go there. I can now control the machine. Now I've got this, I actually am in programming world. So my hardware is good. My controls are good, my control mechanism is good, my serial connection to the device is good, my commands to say go to this location are all good, I can now concentrate on writing software to actually do a drawing. And the drawing I wanted to do was I wanted to take a black and white image and I wanted to do a scribble version of that. So I wrote some software to do that. Uh, and I wrote some software badly to do that and I'll open that up now. <music> So basically what I built was this mechanism which divides the picture up into pixels. And at the moment I'm using a grid size of 10. So I pick a start location like here. And I basically say, what's the, I look at the nine, a grid of three by three around where I start. And I basically say, is, how many dark pixels are there on the original grid? And I look at my target, my, my reference picture, say how many dark pixels are there on my new grid? If there is a one of these cells which has less pixels in, uh, I basically add it to a list of, of possible places to go to. And if that is a good, I basically then I basically pick one at random out of this area and I go there. And that draws one of these lines. And I do that calculation again and again. So what you see here is basically a series of random walks based upon the grid coordinates, not actually based upon anything else. And as you see, it started to walk randomly all the way around here. And it gives me this squirrel effect outline if I actually render that. Here, you can see there's a scribble effect outline going all the way around the outside. Um, I build that up as a Python array. It's actually multiple paths. It takes multiple trips with the randomness to get all the way around the outside, and then to do the eyes is a, a separate path as well. So I now have an array of paths where each path is just a way of x, x y coordinates. And I plug this in, and I thought there is no way that is going to work first time. Um, even with the pen up, pen downs, it's just not going to work. And what I found, much to my surprise, was after I ran it, was it worked. Uh, you can see here the, the, there is a little bit of wobble, but these are actually individual um, points on my scribble all the way around. I had to pen up and pen down between the paths. A lot of manual intervention with that. Um, and I realised that I, I needed a bit more better control, so I then decided, well, I'd actually just write my super array to, to um, a JSON file so I can reload and replay the JSON files. At that point, we start going into the world of some of the animations you've seen already, where I started live uh, twitching them, and we had the Norwich Hackspace logo, which again was a scribble. This was one big scribble for the most part, but they're getting, getting to do some of the details, say, no, focus on that and start at this location to do this bit. Um, there was some weighting and some calculations, so it wouldn't just, it wouldn't try and fill every single pixel, otherwise it would just be shading the whole thing in. Um, so my project scribble is working as a, as a benefit. Uh, the next thing to do was say, are there other forms of input that I can take? And I started looking at SVG. So an SVG, um, basically you take an SVG, which already has the vector. I didn't want to have to work all the coordinates by hand. And the first SVG I did was of a B. Now the B turned out like this. I think, I again, you'll use that uh, time lapse there. Uh, it's a very nice looking B. The lines, a little bit of jerk, and there should be smooth lines. I don't support a curve, so wherever the SVG is like this is a curve, I just treat it as a straight line. So some SVGs are good because they have lots of little bits rather than one long, giant curve. This SVG for my first attempt was fantastic for several reasons. It was a few paths, about 13 paths, I think it was, um, and I, I basically manually pen up, pen down each one. Came out beautiful, left it white ball for the kids to find in the morning. The next SVG I tried actually was a lot more problematic. It was actually one giant path. This is a little Lego man. Um, 
and there were loads of issues around how the how Inkscape had actually encoded my SVG. So the, each SVG I encoded came out differently in the format. So this one actually was one long path, but it had pen up movements in the path. It actually had, in, it had move two commands, which effectively are pen up moves rather than a line two commands. Where the previous one was a series of paths in different groups, this was actually a series of um, uh, one giant line to followed by a move to, so it was one giant path, um, if that makes sense. It's, I found that pretty, pretty weird to, to use, but that's what it did. Uh, finally, I then said, well, let me try something more complicated. Let me actually try um, the one that's on my whiteboard behind me, actually, this one. Uh, I haven't got a photograph of it yet. And this similarly was one giant long path, but it didn't use move to commands for this. So I'm still going to look at the SVG and work out, well, what is it using for SVG? Because if I can go via SVG, I'd have to work out the quotes by hand. So you can see it has, actually has worked if I actually flipped my video. Um, it, it, it's definitely produced twig from Hilda, but these lines here, they're not pen up, pen down. They, they are actually, according to my code, pen down commands, uh, which kind of ruins it a bit because you don't want that in your output. So there's a lot of work to go on on taking SVGs. Now, it isn't me to say I'm not going to stop building code. Uh, the Scribble one was based on something called by Death by Sharpies. I'm not going to continue building my own code to work out my own paths. But I've now got options. I can either go down the SVG route or I can go down um, the route of building my own path calculations. Um, so there's lots of options for, for the next phase. In terms of the hardware and the build, you know, I've got bits of wire, I've got things, straggly bits of uh, cord and connectors and things. This needs to be firmed up more. I need to build a proper wooden mount for it. The gondola needs a lot of, a lot of work. The push-off mechanism needs uh, quite a bit of work. I'm not even going to show what it's like now because it just sort of throws itself around. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, there's a lot of scope for building. The power supply, I want to buy an actual um, switch power supply for it rather than use my laptop power supply because the lab power supply is quite heavy and noisy. Um, there's also been a bit of a complaint that my stepper motors seem to kill my Wi-Fi, which is a bit interesting. Um, I'm not sure why they do that. So but if we're running it in the shed, we'll see if it affects the only the Wi-Fi in the shed or whether I've been uh, causing some EMF there. Maybe they need to be shielded somehow. Um, maybe it's not the stepper motors, but the control unit or something. I'll have to sort of look into what is causing that interference. Um, because we can't be generating Wi-Fi interference. It's, it's a criminal offence in this household and many others, I believe. Anything which kills Wi-Fi destroys everyone Netflix viewing, not fun for everyone involved. Um, but yeah, unattended operation is coming with the pen up pen down mechanism. And also I want to try actually doing a, 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 a Sharpie on paper. I've got the magnets, so I should just go to magnets to the board and see how that comes out. Um, if you're interested in this or have some ideas, please let me know. If you build one yourself, please let me know as well, because I love seeing other people's projects. Um, I, the, a big, big shout out to the Norwich Hackspace, um, who are just amazing at being supportive in whatever ridiculous idea you can come up with. Um, I feel that I am not being as supportive to other people. I think Andy in particular has given me a lot of help, and but Andy and Barney in particular give me a lot of help. Andy in particular, who's building a really, really cool um, a curtain opener. I keep mocking him that his motor isn't powerful enough and he needs to put a much more powerful motor on. Not because he needs a more powerful motor on, just because it would be hilarious to have a super overpowered motor on a curtain opener. But yeah, no, it's it's amazing. And I'm very impressed with this. I'm very impressed with actually how how hard it was to get over the motors moving. But once the motors were moving, for me at least, it became a computer programming problem. And computer programming is sort of my area of strength. So yeah, once I was in the computer programming world, I can now do stuff like this. So going from motors twitching to motors moving took a week of various on and off. Uh, I had power issues. I didn't realize I wasn't giving enough power, all those kind of issues, uh, polarity issues, those kind of things, to that took days. So sort of, sort of once I got over that hump, I'm laughing at that point. Uh, I don't have all the CNC issues people have, like spindle speeds and things stalling. I do have some interesting issues with with the pen. If I make a small movement, th this thing at the moment sort of just sort of just pivots rather than actually moving. So there's a lot of little quirks about what you can and can't do in the machine, and that's very distinct to the fact I'm using a whiteboard. When I move to paper, those frictions will be different, and I can actually have the gondola rest on the paper because I'm not worried about. I might worry about smudging, but I'm not worried about it rubbing off completely. And as the sharpest things dry pretty quickly, I may not even smudging. 
Uh, maximum speed also varies, mileage will vary. Uh, the number of micro steps you do, whether you do full steps or micro steps, that matters as well. Um, so yeah, it, it, uh, well, basically build one, have fun is by saying don't wait 20 years like I did. Uh, I wish I'd built this years and years ago. I don't know what's held me back, to ask you. Uh, so there will be a follow-up video uh, as I try some of the techniques and maybe a bit more about the programming. Um, but yeah, this there was a lot in this video. I realized a lot of theory at the beginning, a lot of uh, build. And again, don't worry about it. You see online people are who are pro YouTubers are doing things like 3D printing their housing before they build it. Like build it out of cardboard, build it out of scrap wood, build it out of whatever. And then if it works, you build it properly. You know, I personally don't do 3D design at the moment, so I didn't bother worrying about the fact I couldn't. Uh, people have these fancy gondolas, I've got a bit of cardboard and I'm producing pretty kick-ass images. Um, so yeah, have fun, don't be stressed out about what other people are doing and, and just enjoy um, building something cool.